So we're dealing with the physiologic female reproductive system. And you'll remember that the main function is uh, the menstrual cycle, which is two link cycles, um, which are going to be the ovarian cycle and the uterine cycle. And the ovarian cycle is what's happening in the ovary, the uterine cycle is what's happening in the uterus, and it's basically this process of preparing an egg to be fertilized from released from the uh, ovary, and then the uterus being prepared to accept that egg if it is fertilized with a nice, comfortable home for the baby to grow up. It's all controlled by hormones. And we remember that uh, right at the end of class last time, we discussed those uh, four major hormones. And as those levels, the physiological levels of those hormones change, we have a response of both the ovaries and of the uterus, in particular the uterine lining, which is called the endometrium. So I want to pick up today and start out just looking at the ovarian cycle. So just remember that when we're dealing with the menstrual cycle, it's these two late cycles. But we're going to look at it each individually, just in your mind, recognize that they are occurring simultaneously through um, that 28 day average progression. So the ovarian cycle is what's going on inside of the ovary. Now, the way that we model this, whenever we show pictures of what's going on inside the ovary, we put everything together sort of in this cyclical pattern that goes around the ovary. But that's not really the way that it would happen. There would be you know, hundreds of thousands of different cells inside of the ovary making up the ovary itself. And we're going to have cells in that are primordial follicles. And those are salt and pepper spread throughout the, the ovary. And a couple of these primordial follicles are going to be targeted every 28 days to begin to go through this maturation process. And wherever they're located physically in the ovary, you're going to see all of these different structures in that single spot. So if I were to take 28 pictures of the ovary and the follicle was, was located right here, every single one of these structures would occur right in that general location. So it's not actually circling around the ovary. That's just the easiest way to model this in a, in a picture. So the ovarian cycle is really focused on the growth the maturation and the release of an oocyte. In that term oocyte or oocytes, this is the reference to that cell, the ovum, that is going to be available to fertilize. So at birth, when a little girl is born, the ovaries individually have about one million of these primary oocytes present per ovary. So collectively within, within both ovaries, about two million. So about one million of these primary oocytes per ovary. And the primary oocyte can also kind of be referred to here as that primordial <coughs> follicle. This one million is going to be the absolute maximum. So at birth, those million oocytes are going to be the most that can ever exist and no more are going to be produced. Which is pretty crazy when you think about it because basically all of the oocytes are present at the point of birth. And actually what we're going to see is we have progression from a million towards less um, during the lifetime of an individual of a female. The uh, primary oocyte is going to be formed by meiosis. And it's going to make it through meiosis one. So it goes through. Uh, first, these stages of mitosis so that we increase these germ cells, uh, increase the germline, the cells that are present in the ovary. And then eventually we get to a point where we have some of these cells differentiate and begin to go through meiosis. But they're just going to go through that first half of meiosis. So they're not going to go through the second half. So these cells are still going to have 46 chromosomes. During that second half, meiosis 2, 
where those 46 chromosomes be 20, be, can become 23 if we're talking about humans. So they sort of get into this state of uh, suspended animation, so to speak, where they're stuck in meiosis one right at that point of birth. In fact, the term that we use here to describe that suspended animation is called G0. You'll remember that the cell cycle is made up of G1, S, G2, and M. We halt them in this G0-like state, where there's growth that's occurring and we're still metabolizing, collecting raw nutrients and things like that. But it's in a halted state. And we're going to remain in that halted state until we reach puberty. So this is roughly 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. And during that time, that million or so per ovary primary oocytes are going to have gone through some pretty significant changes. So at puberty, those 10 years or so, a lot of, and in fact, it's about 70% of those primary oocytes that existed at birth are going to have gone through reabsorption. So even before we get to puberty, we have a large number of these primary oocytes that have been redissolved and broken apart and no longer are primary oocytes. So they've been reabsorbed into the tissue and at puberty we're typically on average left over with about 300,000 oocytes per over. Okay, so we have about 300,000 that are now available. The onset of puberty brings the onset of the menstrual cycle. So now we're going to begin to have these changes, these hormonal changes that are occurring, and we're going to begin to see those, those uh, related changes in the ovarian function and within the uterine function. So from these 300,000 oocytes, we trigger at puberty menstruation to begin, and so we begin the cyclical pattern, averaging about 28 days. And so during a cycle, during one of those 28 day periods, the ovary is going to go through this process of selecting between 10 and 15 of these 300,000 primary oocytes. And those selected 10 to 15 oocytes are going to go through a developmental process. Okay, so we have just this really small uh, cohort or sub, sub cohort of these cells that are going to continue the process. Now they're all still in meiosis 1, so we still have to complete meiosis 1. We have to get down to a point where we just have 23 chromosomes in each of these cells. Of the 10 to 15 that are targeted to begin in an individual ovarian cycle, typically only one is going to complete. So only one of these 10 to 15 will complete the cycle. And so if you kind of go, do, go through and do the math from puberty to menopause, the average, the average individual will produce about 400 to 500 mature oocytes, so that's from the 300,000, 10 to 15 per cycle, with only on average one reaching full maturation during that cycle. You'll have about 400 to 500 that are released during that time period between puberty and menopause, what I'm going to refer to as reproductive years. That 400 to 500 is referred to as the reproductive response. So think about it. If you started out within the organism, 2 million oocytes at birth. And of those 2 million, it's only about 400 to 500 that will continue through the complete process, be ovulated or released from the ovary, and have the potential to be fertilized. 
So let's talk a little bit about that process. So starting from the primary photo site itself, what you will see is when that primary photo site, so here's our primordial follicle. Inside of that primordial follicle is our primary oocyte. So the follicle includes both the ovum, that primary oocyte, and then these support cells. And you can see that these support cells are going to begin to grow and we get some different structures that begin to develop. Collectively, the primary oocyte and then these other support cells are going to be called a follicle. Okay, so we're going to go through this process of taking the primary oocyte or the ovum inside of its follicle to develop it until it can be released from the ovarian tissue to be picked up by the, um, uh, the ovidines. So that primary oocyte is surrounded by a layer of these support cells that are called granulose cells. So we have granulosa cells that help to support that one individual primary oocyte. And again, if this is the beginning of a cycle, we have 10 to 15 of these follicles that are going through the developmental process, that are beginning the developmental process. But only one typically is going to outcompete the other 14 to be, become the one follicle that completely develops. So what's the purpose of those granulosa cells? Well, part of the purpose is to provide nutrients. So these are the cells that help to support nutritionally the developing oocyte or the ova as we go through the rest of this process. So again, collectively, the primary oocyte and those granulosa cells are referred to as the following. And so we go through these stages where that primary oocyte is developing. It's being supported by larger and larger numbers of these granulose cells as this follicle goes through the process of development. Now, the control that's over the, the developmental process here comes from hormone cascades. So we are going to have these programmed releases of hormones from places like the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary to drive the functional process inside of the ovary. To take the ovum, that primary oocyte, and take it through these differentiation processes to trigger the granulose cells to continue to develop, to induce uh, these structural changes as time progresses. So from the hypothalamus, we release a hormone called GnRH. GnRH is gonadotropin releasing hormone. And the gonadotropins are going to be the anterior pituitary hormones, luteinizing hormone, and follicle stimulating hormone. So GnRH is released from the hypothalamus and through the uh, circulation that we have there between the hypothalamus and the pituitary, it's carried to the anterior pituitary. The target for the hormone, gonadotropin releasing hormone, is a group of cells in the anterior pituitary that are called gonadotropes. So gonadotrope is a reference to the cells that produce gonadotropes, uh, or uh, gonadotropins, rather. So gonadotropes produce gonadotropins, LH and FSH. So GnRH is going to cause spikes in luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary. Now remember that the hypothalamus, in the presence of estrogen during fetal development, the hypothalamus is masculinized, right? And we get these really um, pulsatile peaks. If estrogen isn't allowed to masculinize the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus becomes cyclical. And so we have this natural occurrence of GnRH spiking about every 28 days on average. And this drives the rest of the process. And if I take us back to one picture here, you can see that 
LH and FSH, which are responding from the anterior pituitary in the presence of GNRH, at about day 14, they're going to begin to go through these spots. But you also have these slight elevations here, some little smaller peaks that are occurring from days one up until 14. So if you're kind of keeping track of what's going on with the hormones, what you're seeing is that we have some elevation. It's, it's much higher over here than it is over here. So we sort of have this increasing creep in LH and FSH hormone levels, responding to the release of GNRH because GNRH is on a cyclical program. And as those hormone levels begin to increase, you can see that there are changes that are beginning to occur here in the ovary. So this is, these are the, the pictures that you're, you're seeing basically wrapped around here. So as we progress with slightly increasing LH and FSH levels, we're triggering these changes to occur. We go from the primordial follicles, the early primary, late primary, secondary, then to this thing called the graphium follicle. And as we get to the graphium follicle, we're going to eventually get to a point where we have this rush of LH and FSH. We call it the LH and FSH spike. And what you'll see is that LH actually has a much higher spike than FSH. And that spike is what's going to trigger the final step here in the maturation of the follicle, which is to rupture the follicle and release that ovum out into the pelvic cavity where it can be picked up by the ovum. So we have all these hormones that are basically causing this slight little increase that causes these changes to occur for pregnant follicle to rupture. And then we have the spike that comes, especially the LH spike, that causes the rupture to occur. So this is all going to cause the follicle to go through these prep stages on its way to ovulation. The hormones are driving the process here to cause the follicle to be prepared for ovulation. Now, if I go back to the picture again, what you'll see here, estrogen is in red. And right around the same, same time that I have these spikes occurring, notice that I also have a pretty big molecule of estrogen. So I get this spike of estrogen, some really high levels of estrogen as we go through this process and we get to that point where ovulation is going to occur. So we're using FSH, LH to prepare the follicle for ovulation. We're also going to see increases in estrogen. So we have large amounts of estrogen that are released. And really the spike in estrogen is coming from the follicle itself. So we get to a point where LH and FSH drive the process of maturation, and part of that maturation process is for that follicle to then begin to release estrogen. Now, as the follicle progresses, and those granulosa cells continue to develop, and we get more of those granulosa cells, they begin to release a substance that's made up of glycoproteins. So we have this mix or this solution being produced by the granulosa cells that contain this material called glycoproteins. And a glycoprotein is just simply a protein that has sugars that are attached, carbohydrates that are attached. And so what happens here is we begin to form this, casa, um, this um, atrium or antrum inside of that follicle. So we have this open space. So we form this layer around the oocyte and those layers which eventually are going to begin to form these cavities, the layer there, which I'm not really too sure if you can see this, but the very outside, there, it's kind of a rusty, rug, rusty red color. And then on the inside, it's quite a bit more pink in, in, in these pictures here. And that, that inside there, the, the pinker color, is called the zona pellucida. 
So we go through the process of developing this thing called the zona pellucida, and eventually the zona pellucida is going to begin to form the cavity that's called the antrum. So the antrum begins to develop, and, and as this all unfolds, this space begins to fill up with fluid. And is also associated with estrogen and progesterone <coughs> being secreted. So estrogen and progesterone levels are now increasing. We have that estrogen spike that we've already talked about. And we get to a point where we're now in this state called the graphene follicle. That's going to occur after the follicle has fully matured. So we go through follicular maturation. And at this point, what's not shown in this picture is we actually have a division that occurs. Because remember, we're still actually in meiosis one, so we still have 46 chromosomes. And we've got to take care of it. So that cell is actually going to progress finally into meiosis two. And it's going to begin to go through meiosis two. And one of the, the cells that comes off is just called a polar body, and it's basically a little packet of the excess chromosomes. And they're just gotten rid of it, and that regresses and gets recycled. And so we're left over with a oocyte that undergoes meiosis II. We're finally on our way to having our 23 chromosomes packaged away correctly into one cell. That cell is called the secondary oocyte. Okay, so we have the secondary oocyte, and then the, the waste chromosomes are the chromosomes that are just kind of being sloughed off so that we're left over with just 23, is a smaller cell, physical size, smaller, called a polar body. Now, once this has happened, and we have a uh, follicle containing a 23-chromosome oocyte, we're at this mature follicle stage. And that mature follicle is referred to as the graphene follicle. Although it is just as acceptable to just simply refer to it as a mature follicle. So mature or graphene follicle. Now, at this point, because of the development of the antrum, estrogen has been increasingly produced by the ovaries. So now estrogen levels are up pretty high. And if we go back, what you really see, if we're to draw a line in here, and actually you can tell right here at the very top, estrogen is pretty high here. We peaked estrogen. It actually peaks just slightly before the peak that we observed there with luteinizing hormone and follicle stability. So the whole process of maturating the, um, the, the follicle is stimulated by these slight increases, just kind of these little mounds of our gonadotropes, gonadotropins, luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And in that process, as we move towards the mature follicle, once we get to the mature follicle, lots of estrogen is being produced by the ovary. So we get this estrogen spike. And that estrogen spike is right before the luteinizing hormone spike. So with those estrogen levels that are up pretty high, estrogen circulates back onto the pituitary to stimulate the pituitary out of its just sort of slowly increasing LH production to spike LH, to, to jack a bunch of LH into the bloodstream, all in a short amount of time. Now when that happens, we call it a bolus. A bolus is an 
uh, just basically a large uh, a large amount of material, in this case, the luteinizing hormone. So we have this large bolus that's released of luteinizing hormone from the pituitary. And we end up with this thing called the LH spike or the LH surge. Now, what happens with the LH surge is there are receptors on this follicle that bind to LH. And when we get large amounts of LH, we have those receptors bound up in large amounts on that follicle. And this leads towards a biological change that's called ovulation. So now we begin to go through the process of breaking through the ovarian wall so that that, uh -oh, sorry, that ovum, that mature ovum, can now be released so that it can be picked up by the oviduct. So this is the trigger for ovulation to have this LH surge. So ovulation occurs. And what happens with ovulation is our Sec we have just a bunch of material that gets released as that follicle ruptures and breaks through the ovarian wall. So we have the secondary oocyte, that smaller polar body, those cells that make up the zona pellucida, and then the other cells that make up the rest of the follicle, those other granulosa cells, are all released. And they're released into the surrounding tissue, which is basically set up here in the pelvic cavity, very close proximity to the opening into the oviduct. So we end up delivering this material, including, and importantly, that secondary oocyte, into the extracellular fluid and nearby to that oviduct. And hopefully what will happen is that ovum is swept into, you remember that they have the finger-like extensions called fimbriae that have a sweeping motion that's synced up with the heartbeat of mom. And so that sweeping motion begins to sweep in that material and picks up that secondary oocyte, pulls it into the oviduct, and it begins to travel, make its travel down towards the um, down towards the uterus. In this point, we may fertilize that egg. Now, up to this point, we would have been in the very end stages of meiosis. So we aren't completely done with meiosis, too. We're almost done. If we are fertilized, it's the fertilization that causes the completion of meiosis 2, and we now have a proper home. Now, taking a look back at the ovary, the ovarian cycle, we're basically at about day 14. Now, think about what needs to happen here. If we have a pregnancy that's established, we want to make sure that the uterus is prepared and stays prepared to accept that ovum and to nurture, uh, to nurture that ovum. If it's not, then we want to go through and repeat the cycle. So what actually happens is related to the scar tissue that's left over from the rupturing of the fault. There's a bunch of stuff that we just released, right? And I listed all of that. So all of that material gets, gets released, and you're left over basically with a skull. That scar tissue is called the corpus luteum. So the ruptured follicle breaks through the ovarian wall and we're left over with this scar tissue called the corpus luteum. 
So this is basically a remnant sac from the follicle. <coughs> But it still is going to be biologically active. So it's not just simply scar tissue. It's actually scar tissue that does. And what it does is it actually continues to produce estrogen and progesterone. OK, so estrogen and progesterone continue to be produced. So what you'll see is you have ovulation and then you begin to go through and form the corpus luteum. And as we form the corpus luteum, both progesterone here in green and estrogen here in red have another hill that's built. So much higher levels of estrogen are going to continue, much higher levels of progesterone are going to continue as we progress through these luteal stages, these corpus luteum structures. Now that estrogen and progesterone that's released from the corpus luteum is actually going to continue to aid in the uterine cycle. The uterine cycle is the second phase of this process here. So we're going to aid in preparation of the uterus. We're going to help to progress with our estrogen and our progesterone, help to progress that uterine cycle. And this is really important, right, because we want the uterus to be maintained to be thick and healthy in a nurturing environment if fertilization actually happens. So estrogen progesterone levels continue. The uterus continues to stay in its nutritive state. In addition, the estrogen and progesterone inhibit FSH. Now, as we inhibit FSH, FSH levels are going to drop. FSH is what triggers follicles to mature. So remember, we had 10 to 15 primordial follicles that begin to go through this process, but only one typically is going to make it. FSH is the signal that basically says, let's mature, let's mature. So we have one of those follicles that matures faster than all of the rest. And as it goes through that maturation process and it ruptures, the others are actually still developing, but they haven't developed as quickly as this, what's called the, um, what's called the primary follicle. So with estrogen and progesterone now being introduced by the corpus luteum, we actually lift this FSH signal. Remember that FSH is kind of elevated, and we have that little spike. FSH levels are not going to drop because the uh, pituitary is going to be inhibited, and so other follicles are going to be stopped in their tracks and will match, um, mature no further. So maturation is stopped. Now what happens next is dependent upon fertilization. So basically at this point we have two different options. We can become pregnant if we fertilize that egg, or we might have no pregnancy if we don't fertilize that egg. So I want to kind of go through this um, kind of give you a table. Maybe, does everybody have all this? Maybe I'll clear everything off. Everybody good? Okay, so the question becomes, what happens in the case of pregnancy versus no pregnancy? Okay, so what are the things that are going to happen? Well, first of all, if we have a pregnancy, the embryo begins to form. So right at the point of conception, we know a lot about the organism, or about the, I'm not the organism, about the, the baby that's developed. We already can determine sex, because that's determined genetically. We've already targeted this, uh, this individual to become male or female. We're targeting organs to begin to develop. This process begins to occur, occur immediately. So this embryo begins to develop new tissues. One of the tissues that's going to be developed is a tissue called chorion. Okay, so we have this tissue, it's called chorion. If there is no pregnancy, we don't develop anything called chorion. So with pregnancy, we get this tissue called chorion. Without pregnancy, we do not get chorion. Chorion is so important because it begins to produce a hormone called HCG. 
Has anyone ever heard of HCG? It's human cardio, uh, cardiotropic gonadotropin. Where have you run into HCG? Maybe another college in the <laughs> This is the hormone <laughs> that is used in pregnancy tests. So a pregnancy test is going to be on the stick and you're detecting HCG. Without chorion, that means no HCG. If we have HCG, what happens is HCG, not only do we pick it up in the urine, but it comes in, it actually targets to the corpus luteum. So remember, what's the corpus luteum doing? It's producing estrogen and progesterone. So we're going to go through this process, center of HCG, where that hormone is going to be used to rescue, rescue the corpus luteum. Over here, without HCG, that scar tissue heals. And so that corpus luteum is going to be lost. Now, as long as progesterone and estrogen remain high, we maintain the uterine lining to be conducive for growth of a newborn. Over here, without the corpus, lute corpus luteum, the cycle is going to repeat. We're going back to the very beginning. We're going to select a new group of 10 to 15, uh, 10 to 15 follicles or oocytes, and they're going to begin the process. With pregnancy, we rescue the corpus luteum. And what happens is those estrogen and progesterone hormones continue to be pumped out from the corpus luteum. And they've pumped out for about 9 to 10 weeks. So for about 9 to 10 weeks, we continue to maintain the uterus. We get a nice thick uterus that's nutritive, that's a comfortable, cozy place for this follicle to develop. So for the next 9 to 10 weeks, the embryo continues to go through embryogenesis and continues to develop. We have new tissues that develop. One of the tissues that develops is the placenta. The placenta is pretty much fully formed by 10 weeks. And after that 10, 9 to 10 week time period, the placenta takes over production of progesterone. So we're going to have elevated progesterone levels initially from the ovary, and in particular the corpus luteum, and then after about 10 weeks, the placenta is developed, and the placenta begins to generate, uh, generate progesterone, which is really kind of cool because the first 9 to 10 weeks, it's all on mom, right? Mom's corpus luteum is what's going to keep baby alive. And then pretty soon, baby develops to a point where baby has the control over progesterone as a hormone and continues to keep mom and mom's uterus in a healthy environmental state for that rest of that development. After those 10 weeks, another about 28 weeks, about 38 weeks average right now is uh, when um, labor begins and we have a bundle of joy. All right, so let's take a look at the uterine cycle. Remember that the uterine cycle is what's going on inside of the uterus. And this is happening alongside or in concert with the ovaries, or the ovarian cycle. So the uterine cycle is going to see, cease if a fertilized egg arrives. Basically, we get the progesterone levels that are elevated and are maintained, and we cease the cycle for that 38 or 40 week time period. If there is no fertilized egg, we continue through a cycle. And this is basically the cycle. You'll see that there are three different phases, and they're basically all associated with the thickening and anatomical development of that layer of tissue called the endometrium. 
So we have the three phases. The first phase is the menstrual phase. And the menstrual phase typically lasts from days one to day five. So here's day one down here. Here's day 28 up here. So days one to day five on average. Now, what happens from day one to day five, if there is no fertilized egg, we continue on the uterine cycle. Again, if there is fertilized egg, we basically maintain the sticking lining for a prolonged period of time because that's what's supporting fetal and embryogenic development. So with no fertilized egg, we're going to have estrogen and progesterone levels drop. So they're going to begin to decline. And it's those estrogen and progesterone levels that are required to maintain a thickened endometrium. So without that endometrial lining being as thick as it is, it's no longer being maintained, we're going to begin to lose the anatomical structure of the endometrium. So it's real thick, estrogen and progesterone levels begin to drop, and what happens is these blood vessels that are inside of the endometrial lining, they begin to break. So the blood vessels begin to burst, and as those blood vessels burst, it no longer maintains the other cells in the endometrium, and so the blood and those cells begin to be sloughed. In this process of uterine sloughing, which is just to get rid of the blood and the cells and all that material from the uterine lining, is what actually forms the menstrual flow. Okay, so for the first five days called the menstrual phase, this is the menstrual flow. And menstrual flow should incrementally decrease in the amount of material that's being sloughed from the uterus, and on about day five, menstrual flow should stop, and we'll move into the second phase, which is the proliferative phase. Proliferative phase is going to last typically from day six up till about fourteen. Now, remember what happens right around day fourteen in the uterus or in the ovaries. Yeah, that's right around ovulation. So basically, this proliferative phase is going to end right around the time ovulation occurs. And then within about three to four days, the ovum is going to arrive in the uterine cavity. So during this time, during these days 6 to 14, estrogen levels in response to what's happening in the ovaries are going to begin to rise. So we begin to see that increase in estrogen. Again, coming from the ovary and in particular coming from the developing follicle itself. So the follicles begin to pump out estrogen as they go through the maturation process. Estrogen circulates absolutely everywhere. It affects the uterine tissue. And so we begin to see, in response to this heightened estrogen, those endometrial cells to begin to proliferate. And so the endometrium, that inner tissue lining the uterus, begins to go through this thickening process. New cells are being produced. New cells are being developed. We also begin to develop more blood vessels. And the way the blood vessels begin to develop is out of the myometrium, which the blood vessels never disappeared from the myometrium, they were wiped away during the menstrual phase. They begin to spiral up into that endometrial tissue. 
So it begins to spiral up, and we have this spiral blood supply into those new forming cells. Now, the blood's not coming out at this point. That only happens during the menstrual phase. But it's supplying nutrients and waste removal and oxygen to these, uh, these new cells, this new tissue that's developing. In addition to the vessels that are being produced, there are more glands that begin to develop as well. This is a glandular tissue. And so we get these glands that begin to develop. And as those glands develop, they begin to secrete substance. And that secreted fluid is going to aid with lubrication. And it helps out with things like allowing the sperm to travel effectively up towards the oviduct where fertilization is going to occur. So remember, what are we doing here with reproduction? We're trying to take the impossible and make it probable. So this is another point where we see that probability increasing. Now, at the end of this proliferative stage, this is right around day number 14, ovulation occurs. So the ovary, we're going to have that rupture. Ovum is going to be released, swept into the oviduct. We're going to continue the ovarian cycle. Fertilization may, may happen. And then here, days basically 15 up to 28 from middle cycle to the end of the cycle, we're going to have our final stage before we head back into the menstrual phase. And this will be the secretory phase. Now, that secretory phase is going to be the phase in which implantation occurs. And what do I need to do if implantation occurs? I need to provide a conducive environment for that fertilized egg to survive and to grow and to flourish. So during the secretory phase, we're basically creating a positive environment, a healthy environment for that ovum. By this point, we have our corpus luteum that's been formed, that scar tissue left over from ovulation. And it's producing estrogen and progesterone. So we have estrogen and progesterone being produced in higher levels. Go back just a couple of pages here. You can see that we now have that thickened um, tissue here during the secretory phase. And we have those second mounds of estrogen and progesterone as they've increased inside of the bloodstream. So that endometrium is very thick now. And this is what's extremely important in terms of fetal survival. We're talking something on the order of about 15 millimeters of thickness. If you get anywhere below five, it's no longer conducive. It's actually called a hostile uterine environment. And by the way, just a little side note here, if you use birth, birth control, everybody's like, oh, it reduces my menstrual flow. It doesn't take as long and all of this, all of these great things. The reason is because it makes a hostile uterine environment. And that's one of the effects of birth control that they don't ever really talk about, but it prevents implantation. So even if the egg is fertilized, even if you have conception, if you use birth control, you don't have a uterine environment that can, that can actually support that development. Age. And that's why we call them Florida fictions, because they actually will induce loss of a pregnancy, a viable pregnancy, if they're, uh, if they're used um, as, a, as a birth control method. So we need that very thick endometrial lining, very, very important. Those glands are going to secrete a glycoprotein mix, which we've already hit on with the ovaries. And that glycoprotein mix provides nutritional support for the fertilized egg. Now, the last thing that had happened, so we would continue to have these elevated levels of uh, endometrial thickness if pregnancy occurs. 
The last thing that will happen if pregnancy occurs is remember we have a cervical opening that leads into the vaginal canal, right? And that's basically an open pathway from the external environment. We go through the vaginal orifice into the vaginal cavity and then to the cervix. So it's good if we sort of block the cervix. So what happens is, is cervical diameter decreases and, and there's sort of a thickened mucus that gets layered over, um, over the cervical opening. And sometimes I've heard it referred to as a cervical plug. I'm not really convinced that it's actually a cervical plug, like it blocks the cervical opening. I think we just have this sticking, uh, the sticking mucus in the cervix that is, is sticky and helps prevent microorganisms from getting into the uterus. So basically that cervical mucus provides a mechanical blockade or a mechanical barrier for microbial invasion. This video.